The Sudeten Crisis and its iconic ending of Neville Chamberlain waving his agreement with Hitler around in the air has gone down the history books as one of the most important events in the lead up to World War II, but then its sequel, the occupation of the rest of the Czech part of Czechoslovakia, has been completely memory hold and it only gets a passing mention as if it was a random act of aggression. It unironically goes along the lines of this 99% of the time. What's the catch? Just sign this piece of paper promising you won't invade the rest of Czechoslovakia. Okay. Then Chamberlain returned home victorious, waving his signed piece of paper in the air, declaring crisis to be averted and the continuation of world peace, and we built a statue of Chamberlain in his honor, and every day on the 30th of September we celebrate Chamberlain Day. Hitler's invading the rest of Czechoslovakia. What? He's invading the rest of Czechoslovakia. Oh. You lied to me. What do you expect? I'm Hitler. But what really happened? Surely it was more complicated than random aggression. The answer is that it was, in fact, far more complicated than most would have you believe, and today I'll give you the full story of how the occupation of Bohemia and Moravia came to be. First of all, a quick disclaimer. This video is part of my series on the life of Adolf Hitler, and of course, both the man himself and also the topic of occupying foreign countries is always going to be controversial. In this instance, however, I will be giving no opinions of my own, and the video is entirely a work of history, so please, don't ever think it. All my sources will be linked in the description. Thank you. Secondly, this video is easily watchable on its own, but if you would like to start from the start of my series on the life of Adolf Hitler, then you are more than welcome to do so. The playlist will be in the description, and it is also linked on my channel homepage. Lastly, of course, as always, a huge thank you to my Patreon, Subscribestar, and YouTube members who make these videos possible. These videos aren't monetized immediately, and they have to undergo a manual review. They are all eventually accepted, However, this also means that I only make a fraction of the revenue I would normally from ads. Entirely thanks to my kind subscribers, however, I'm able to do this as my full-time job, and I cannot thank them enough. So if you would like to support the channel, join our Discord, or the Weekly Hearts of Iron 4 games, then please do consider signing up in one of the links in the description. Thank you. After the drama of the Munich Agreement, the world began to wonder what Hitler's next move would be. The warmongers, who were being paid to bring about a conflict, such as Winston Churchill and Duff Cooper, began to whip up a storm, telling the world that the Sudetenland was but the first domino in Hitler's evil plan for world conquest. Many, whether they be paid shills or naive members of the general population, began to join in with this call. Rumours flew around London of what would happen next. One came about in the form of Eric Cord. Cord was a member of the anti-Hitler group who were determined to bring Hitler down no matter the cost the most famous of which later was of course General von Stauffenberg, and he was a prime example of a man who was furious at the nobility's fall from grace with the advent of the new Hitler regime. Now, at least on paper, all Germans were equal as Germans. Many of the former nobility simply refused to accept this new way of looking at the world, and they opposed Hitler at every turn. In 1938, however, the plan was to take down Hitler if he chose to declare war on Czechoslovakia. This didn't come to pass, and then the conspiracy took a new form, ridiculous lies. Cord worked in the London Foreign Office and began to spin these lies. One of which was that Hitler had a sudden plan to bomb London. This was for some reason taken so seriously that Chamberlain arranged an emergency meeting. The bombing didn't come to pass, of course, but the suspicion was there. Other rumours, such as Hitler wanting to launch an invasion of Ukraine or Romania, also flew around at the time. Nothing made sense anymore, but in the wild move of provocation whipped up by men like Churchill, people, and most importantly, Chamberlain, began to think they were true. A.J.P. Taylor writes in The Origins of the Second World War, quote, They anticipated an attack on Holland and resolved to treat this as a casus belli. Switzerland, too, was supposed to be endangered, or there might be a surprise air attack on England. These were nightmares without substance. There is not the smallest fragment of evidence that Hitler ever considered such plans, even in the most remote way. Neville Henderson was more accurate when he wrote on the 18th of February, My definite impression is that Herr Hitler does not contemplate any adventures at the moment. Why should he have done so? Eastern Europe was falling into his lap. Hungary, Romania and Yugoslavia were competing for his favour. France had abandoned Eastern Europe. Soviet Russia was estranged from the Western powers. Poland remained on friendly terms with Germany, despite the exasperating failure to find a solution to the Danzig question. The only cloud came from Czechoslovakia. Not that she could pursue a foreign policy independent of or hostile to Germany, but as both Benes and Hitler had foreseen, it was impossible to hold the state together once Czech prestige and power were shaken. Few people appreciated this in the West, and the admirers of Czechoslovakia kept quiet about it. In Western eyes, Czechoslovakia was a happy, democratic state, 
wantonly dismembered by Hitler. In fact, it was a state of nationalities created by Czech initiative and maintained by Czech authority. Once this was broken, disintegration followed, just as the collapse of the Habsburg monarchy followed defeat in the First World War." End quote. Whilst the world wondered what Hitler would do next, one man did not, and that was Hitler himself. After the success at Munich, he went to his favourite place in the world, the Berghof. Here, he simply spent his time drawing up plans for the rebuilding of Linz, the Austrian town he had grown up in. Sometimes he would complain to those around him that he was robbed of his chance of smashing Czechoslovakia in a war and riding into Prague as the victor. President Benes had done all he could to bring about a war between the Czechs and Germany. In 1936, just months after Hitler had come to power, there was a serious possibility of a Polish-Czech invasion of Germany to preempt Hitler's irredentist goals. In 1938, Benes made his move with fake rumours, which he himself planted, and used these as a justification to mobilise on the German border. In the end, his gamble failed, and he had to run off into exile, and Hitler gained the Sudetenland. For Hitler though, this was personal, not with the Czechs, but with Benes, and he felt he'd been robbed of the opportunity for revenge. Now, Benes was running around London trying to whip up a war harder than he ever had before. Regardless, Hitler carried on with his artistic pursuits at the Berghof. In late October, the military wanted to know what they should be preparing for next. Hitler replied on the 21st, quote, The Wehrmacht must at all times be prepared for the following. 1. Securing the frontiers of the German Reich and protection against surprise air attacks. 2. Liquidation of the remainder of the Czech state. End quote. This is normally where the quoting of the directive ends, and it's given as a clear indication that Hitler wanted to destroy Czechoslovakia immediately. But Hitler carried on to specify in the same directive, quote, it must be possible to smash the remainder of the Czech state should it pursue an anti-German policy, end quote. AJP Taylor calls these, quote, measures of precaution, not plans of aggression, end quote. And he continued on, quote, these directives have often been quotes as proof that Hitler was never sincere in accepting the Munich Agreement. The truth is rather that Hitler doubted whether the settlement would work. Though often regarded as politically ignorant, he understood better than other European statesmen the problem of Bohemia and believed, without sinister intention, that independent Czechoslovakia would not survive when deprived of her natural frontiers and with Czech prestige broken. This was not a wish for Czechoslovakia's destruction. It was a belief held also by Masaryk and Benes when they created Czechoslovakia in 1918. It was the principle on which Czechoslovak independence had rested from first to last." End quote. Essentially, Benes had gambled away the Sudetenland, the area which basically made the entire state function. I'll quote myself from my video, The Complete History of the Sudeten Crisis. Quote, The real reason for the Sudetenland to be included was not due to any real claims the Czechs had on the area, but due to the defensible mountainous terrain and raw materials there. Benes claimed that without the sugar refineries, glassworks, textile mills, smelters and breweries in these lands, the state would not survive. End quote. He was right, the state wouldn't survive, and almost immediately, what was left of Czechoslovakia began to unravel. The Slovaks felt that the promises of Masaryk of regional autonomy simply hadn't been delivered. The country was called Czechoslovakia, but the reality was that it was a Czech state. One example is that of the 8,000 civil servants in the government offices, only 200 were Slovaks. In October 1938, the Slovaks and Ruthenians successfully caused enough of a ruckus to be granted their own regional parliaments. Instead of working within the system with these, however, the delegates in these parliaments just pushed towards eventual independence. For this fact, Hitler wasn't innocent either. Ever since Munich, agents from Himmler's SS, Goebbels' propaganda ministry, Goering's four-year plan, and the Nazis' foreign organisation were deep inside the Slovakian half of Czechoslovakia, stirring up nationalist sentiment. On the 21st of January, 1939, Hitler had a meeting with the Czech foreign ministry in which he demanded total Czech neutrality, as well as a reduction in the Czech armed forces. Hitler simply did not trust the Czechs anymore after the past six years of drama. Around this time too, contact was made with Wojtek Tuka and Hitler. Tuka was a Slovak agitator who had just been released from prison after Benes ran off to England. And in Hitler, he saw his country's path to full independence rather than the current hyphenated semi-independence with the Czechs. He quote, telegraphed to Hitler a fulsome appeal to protect the Slovaks and accept them as the economic and cultural colleagues of the illustrious German nation, end quote. On the 10th of February, Franz Karmasin, the head of the ethnic Germans in Slovakia, was informed that sometime in the coming month or so, things would be coming to a head with the Czechs. 
and that they should take the necessary measures for such an event. On the 12th, Tuka visited Hitler personally and told him, quote, my people await their total liberation by you, end quote. At the same time as this, there was the Hungarian issue. The Hungarians had seen the majority of their lands taken from them after the Great War, and now the focus point of their entire political scene was the return of at least some of these lands. When Hitler came to power, the Hungarians too saw their opportunity. When it came to the Munich crisis, the Hungarians acted laughably slow, however, despite all their words to the contrary, and Hitler would constantly mock them and their leader Horthy in private for being all talk. After a meeting with Horthy about the Slovak matter during the Sudeten crisis, he lost all sympathy with the Hungarian cause. David Irving writes in The Warpath, quote, It was inconceivable to him that Hungary was so reluctant to fight to regain her part of Slovakia. As he sourly pointed out to Imredi that afternoon, this is going to be a cold buffet. There will be no way to service. Everybody will have to help himself, end quote. And quote, the Fuhrer recalled how strongly he had warned the Hungarians both on board ship and when Imredi and Kanya had visited him at the Ober Salzburg. He had told them specifically that he was planning to settle the Czech problem, so or so, in October. Poland had seen her chance, struck out, and got what she wanted. You can solve such problems by negotiation, only if you're determined to fight otherwise. It was only this that gained for him, the Fuhrer, everything that he wanted. Mr. Kanya was plagued by misgivings, however, even though the Fuhrer had told him that Britain and France weren't going to fight, end quote. And finally, Hitler himself said, quote, I am not annoyed with Hungary, but she has missed the bus, end quote. For Hitler, the Hungarian ship had sailed, and now he would try his luck with the Slovaks, who proved far more willing to work with him, and as a result, till the end of the war, Hitler and the Slovaks would remain loyal friends, whilst the Hungarian relationship was always a strained one, with Horthy wanting everything his way, and at his own slow pace. Some of the distaste for Hungary actually resulted from matters outside of their control, it was discovered between the two crises that Count Ciano, the Italian foreign minister, and Benito Mussolini's son-in-law, had hatched a strange policy of wanting to build up Hungary in order to halt Germany. Ribbentrop immediately saw through this policy, and it didn't help Hungary's cause at all, or the Germans' trust of the Italians for that matter. For now, however, Goering especially would use the Hungarian card to push the Slovaks to act. When economics minister Dukanski met him on the 28th of February, Goering said to him in typical Goering fashion, quote, now, what's it going to be? When are you going to declare independence so we don't have to turn you over to the Hungarians?" End quote. Hitler, for his part though, genuinely seemed to care about the Slovak cause, and it suited him nicely. AJP Taylor wrote, quote, The Slovaks were a new element in Hitler's calculations, free both from the Czech devotion to democracy and from the Hungarian illusions of greatness. He regretted that he had not known earlier of the Slovak struggle for independence. It is often held that Hitler favoured Slovakia as a route for invading Ukraine. Geography really makes this as impractical as the reverse idea that Soviet Russia could threaten Germany through Czechoslovakia. Hitler backed Slovakia for her own sake, a steady, reliable satellite as she proved to be throughout the Second World War." End quote. The Czechs quickly caught wind of the Slovakians' intentions. After all, tensions had been rising, and ever since the Germans and the Sudetenland gained their freedom, the Slovakians would obviously be soon to follow. On the 9th of March, the Czechs gave their reply. The Slovak government was dismissed, and the Czech army marched into Slovakia. They had had enough of the radical calls for independence from men such as Tuka. They took the gamble, much as they had in regards to the Sudeten crisis. The state itself was barely independent by this point anyway, in reality, it was a nation simply trying to comply as best as they could with Germany's wishes. Regardless, they felt they had just enough autonomy left to put the Slovaks back in line. When Hitler got the news early on the 10th of March, he was left with two options. Letting the Czechs restore their prestige in such a way was out of the question, and regardless, the Slovaks seemed good to have on side. If he made the Czechs stay out, but didn't support the Slovaks, then Hungary would undoubtedly move in. It is unlikely Horthy would be asleep at the wheel a second time. As a result, he made the logical choice of supporting the Slovaks. Father Tiso, the Slovak Prime Minister, had taken refuge in a Jesuit college. Hitler quickly sent for him, but things weren't so easy. Confusion reigned in Czechoslovakia, and Emil Hascher, the Czech president, had already appointed a replacement for Tiso. It was beginning to appear as if the Slovaks had given up hope and weren't playing along. Germany wanted to intervene and help, but they had no official appeal from the Slovaks to do so. On the 13th, Hitler's agent arrived in Bratislava, found Tiso and brought him to Germany. Tiso was told to make up his mind and proclaim Slovakian independence, and to do it now. 
After some brief hesitation, Tiso agreed and telephoned the Slovak cabinet in Bratislava, telling them what needed to be done. He then headed back to Slovakia at full speed, assembled his deputies and read off the Slovak Declaration of Independence that had been written up with the help of Ribbentrop. An independent Slovakia was born. Thanks to the help of Germany, the two would now be inseparable allies. Carpathian Ruthenia also declared independence a few days later, but the Germans didn't care much for their fate and allowed the Hungarians to take it. Now was left the question of what to do with the rest of Czechoslovakia, or now rather just Czechia. Their gamble had failed thanks to the interference of Germany. They were now in all but name a puppet state. Thankfully for Hitler, this question was answered for him, and Hascha, the Czech president, requested a meeting, much like Austrian Chancellor Schussenig had before the Anschluss. Hascha was left bewildered and hopeless. His gamble had failed. He had tried to keep the nation together, but evidently that was no longer possible. Now, with just the rump Czech state left, he didn't have high hopes for the future. He had already towed a very pro-Hitler line, and he'd been a good neighbour, but now, with his state literally falling apart, he saw only one option. Before he even arrived, he told Ribbentrop that he was coming to quote, place the fate of the Czech state in the hands of the Fuhrer. His request for a meeting was accepted, and Hitler ordered full military honours for his arrival. Hascha, by this point, couldn't handle flying. His heart simply couldn't take it. So he took the train instead, along with his daughter, who also acted as his nurse. Upon arrival, flowers were sent personally from Hitler to her room with a handwritten note. It was only at 11pm, on the evening of the 14th of March, that Hitler and Hascha were finally ready for their meeting, and the old man was ushered in to meet the Fuhrer. Everyone was ordered to leave except for Ribbentrop and Wolfer Huhl, and they got down to business. Hascha began with a speech thanking Hitler for receiving him. He told Hitler that he had heard so much about his quote, wonderful ideas he had often read about and followed with interest, end quote. He explained that he felt no connection with the previous antagonistic government of Benes and Masaryk. He met Masaryk only once a year at the judge's dinner, and he had met Benes even less often. He said that the regime was so foreign to him that he, quote, asked himself whether it was fortunate for Czechoslovakia to be an independent state at all, end quote, and continued on, quote, he was convinced that the destiny of Czechoslovakia lay in the Fuhrer's hands and believed that that destiny was in safekeeping in the hands of the Fuhrer, end quote. He told Hitler of his efforts to improve the Czech opinion of the Germans during his short time in office, but that his efforts had been sabotaged by the previous 20 years of Czech chauvinism promoted by Benes, in which he whipped up the population to not only hate the Germans, but to desire to expel them from so-called Czech lands, or worse, kill them all. Hascha had had quite the uphill battle to undo this propaganda. Hitler, for his part, took it well, and he explained to Hascha that he was going to send the German army in, and that Hascha should order the Czech armed forces not to resist. The reality was, however, that this decision had already been taken beforehand. In fact, the SS Liebstandart had already been sent in to secure the Morava Ostrava industrial complex near the Polish border, which the Poles were planning to pounce on and take. The Czechs there, much preferring a German occupation to a Polish one, offered no resistance, and the area was secured. Irving says, quote, as the monologue continued, Hitler grew uneasy. The more Hascha rambled on about how hardworking and conscientious the Czechs were, he would recall in May 1942, the more I felt I was sitting on red-hot coals, knowing that the invasion order had already been issued. Hitler told him that at 6am, the Wehrmacht would invade Bohemia and Moravia, but the country's autonomy was assured. If Hascha would sign on the dotted line, there would be no bloodshed. I'm almost ashamed to admit that we have one division standing by for each Czech battalion." End quote. He also said to Hascha regarding autonomy, quote, "...in this case, your people still have good prospects for the future. I will guarantee them autonomy, far beyond what they could ever have dreamed of in the time of Austria." End quote. There was still an ounce of doubt in Hascha's mind, however, and Hitler resorted to his usual tactics to push things over the line. General Keitel came in a couple of times to interrupt Hitler and talk about military matters with the intention of scaring Hascha. All the while, Hascha was constantly on the telephone to Prague, trying to ensure that the Czech military would behave, and making sure that everyone knew what was going on. The connection was terrible, however, and he would often have to shout into the phone several times. At around 3am, Hascha actually suffered heart failure from all the stress. Hitler's physician, Professor Morel, had to revive him with an injection. Time was of the essence, and the show had to go on. Hitler reminded Hascha of the military situation. He simply could not pump the brakes now. And Goering, who turned up late, warned that if this continued, then at daybreak, his Luftwaffe would appear over the streets of Prague. At around 4am, Hascha ensured the compliance of the Czech military, and all seemed ready. He then signed on the dotted line. After this, all the guests left one by one, and then Father Tiso, the Slovak Prime Minister, was brought in, and told of the results. 
After this, Hitler opened the invisible door behind his desk, where his two secretaries were. He walked in and shouted out, Well, children, now put one here and here, one peck each, and tapped both his cheeks. They both kissed him, and he shouted out, This is the most wonderful day of my life. I have now accomplished what others strove in vain for centuries to achieve. Bohemia and Moravia are back in the Reich. I will go down in history as the greatest German of all time." End quote. At 8am, the invasion of Czechoslovakia officially began. By 9am, the German army was in Prague, where there was no resistance to be found. Hitler himself was on his way first by train, and then by car. And after seeing how well received the Germans were, he decided to simply drive right into Prague, much to the dismay of Himmler and the security staff. At 4pm he crossed the Czech frontier in an open top car, in which he stood up saluting his regiments. At dusk, he arrived in Prague, and was taken to Hradkani Castle. A guide was found to show them to a place where Hitler and his entourage could get some rest later. The Führer then stayed up writing a law establishing the German protectorate over Bohemia and Moravia. At 2am he finally ate and a cold buffet arrived for him along with a Pilsen beer which he was encouraged to try. He did but looked disgusted and refused to finish it. He then went to bed. The first that many citizens of Prague knew of Hitler's presence was when his swastika rose above the palace roof the next morning. In Italy Mussolini was furious. Quote, even Mussolini was disgruntled. He complained to Ciano on 15th of March. Quote, Every time Hitler occupies a country, he sends me a message. He dreamt of creating an anti-Hitler front, based on Hungary and Yugoslavia. By the evening, he had recovered his temper. We cannot change our policy now. After all, we are not political whores. And he once more paraded his loyalty to the Axis. End quote. The French simply didn't care. The French foreign minister said, quote, the renewed drift between Czechs and Slovaks only shows that we nearly went to war last autumn to boost up a state that was not viable." End quote. In London, the initial reaction was that it was a matter that shouldn't concern them. The British public didn't feel the same way, however. They had undergone far too much Churchill propaganda to give Hitler the benefit of the doubt. After all, from the outside looking in, the occupation looked much like brazen aggression. Eventually, Chamberlain was obliged to make an anti-Hitler speech on the matter. Quote, is this in fact a step in the direction of an attempt to dominate the world by force?" End quote. A week later though, Hitler got quite a different message. In fact, Chamberlain had been trying to get out of Britain's guarantee to Czechoslovakia for months now, and this suited him quite nicely. Quote, About a week later, however, Chamberlain reassured Hitler for a third party that he quite sympathised with Germany's move, even though he was unable to say so in public as he was being exposed to intemperate attacks by the Churchill clique. End quote. The tears of Churchill and his paid warmongers paled in comparison to the actual benefits Hitler would receive from the occupation, however. His eastern border had been shortened by 1,000 miles. He had a mass of new airfields to defend Germany, or to attack Poland or Russia if the need arose. The Czech gold reserves would save Germany from the current problems facing their economy. Romania and Yugoslavia were entirely reliant on the Skoda arms factories, which were now in Hitler's control. As a result, they would slowly drift into his orbit and be forced to accept a pro-German line. Most of all, the occupation gave them an unbelievable supply of military equipment. In fact, during the invasion of France, a massive amount of the tanks were actually just Czech ones. Richard Tidor writes in his book Hitler's Revolution, quote, Quartermaster General Edward Wenger wrote his wife on March the 30th that the quantity of combat ordnance discovered in this small country was downright frightening. The inventory included 1,582 aircraft, 2,175 field guns, 468 tanks, 501 anti-aircraft guns, 785 mortars, 34,856 machine guns, over a million rifles, 3 million artillery rounds, a considerable array of military specialty items such as bridge building equipment and searchlights, plus over a billion rounds for the infantry. It consisted of up-to-date, well-designed weaponry. Modern production facilities such as the Skoda plant were expansive enough to simultaneously fill defence contracts for the USSR." End quote. There was benefits for the Czechs too. NSV, the German National Social Welfare Organization, immediately moved in and in the first 10 days, 7 million Reichsmarks worth of food was distributed to the population, as well as 5 million Reichsmarks worth of clothing. The German authorities also quickly arranged for the restocking of grocery and department stores. The local ethnic German party was also barred from gaining control of the economy or the public administration so as to not freak out the Czech majority. 
The Czech army was forcibly reduced from 150,000 men to 7,000, but dismissed officers would be given a full pension regardless of length of service. Czechs were also not made to enlist in the German army, and this remained a fact throughout the entire war. The Czechs retained control of all aspects of their nation, except for foreign policy and the economy. Konstantin von Neurath was tasked with this role for the Germans. He had always been sympathetic to the Czechs, and he was a welcomed appointment by them. When the Germans came in, they entered a land of 150,000 unemployed. They quickly set up jobs programs, and within the first month, 15,000 took advantage and were back in the workforce. Big Czech industry was also quickly given rich contracts from the Reich. In fact, many Czechs grew to love the prosperity from the occupation. During the war, this was so alarming that it was driving Benes and Churchill insane. It flew in the face of all their propaganda that Reinhard Heydrich, the then protector of Bohemia and Moravia, was so loved by the Czechs. This was meant to be the devil incarnate, Heinrich Himmler's top guy, but regardless, the Czechs were pretty happy. He introduced revolutionary new social security and pension schemes, and they saw never before seen prosperity. The Allies simply couldn't accept this, and as we know, they sent assassins to kill him. 30,000 Czechs immediately demonstrated against his murder in the main square in Prague, but it was too late. The assassination worked, and Hitler brutally responded in Lidice. This heavy price meant no other top Nazis would be assassinated in this way, as most leaders simply wouldn't be able to stomach such blowback. But Churchill got his wish, and he was overjoyed with the deterioration in the Czech lands, which eventually led to the mass genocide of all Germans there at the end of the war. Hasha, for his part, remained in place throughout the occupation, and there was never ill will between him and the Germans, but the old man would be brutally tortured and murdered in an allied prison in 1945 for his efforts. Slovakia was invaded by Hungary later that same month. It's known as the Little War, so as the name suggests, they didn't get very far, and with the pressure that Germany would support Slovakia, the Hungarian resolve quickly dissolved, and the Slovaks held well. The Hungarians only made very moderate gains in the end. Slovakia ended up joining Hitler's war in the East in 1941, and were actually known for their high quality, amidst a sea of terrible and ineffective allies, like Italy, or even the Slovak's traditional enemy, Hungary. As for the Czechs, after the establishment of the Protectorate, the Czechs just sort of existed and carried on living in relative prosperity, while the rest of Europe blew themselves to pieces. History is written that they were betrayed by the West, and that the Poles a year later were saved. This view is completely faulty, however. AJP Taylor puts it into perspective, quote, Less than 100,000 Czechs died during the war. Six and a half million Poles were killed. Which was better, to be a betrayed Czech or a saved Pole? I am glad Germany was defeated and Hitler destroyed. I also appreciate that others paid the price for this, and I recognise the honesty of those who fought the price too high." End quote. Opinions vary from book to book on exactly how willing Hascha handed over his country, but pretty much all of them agree that he was willing in some regard. Czechoslovakia as a state had clearly failed, and everything was collapsing. If the nation wasn't handed over to Germany to restore order, the future would have been extremely unclear. On the other hand, if Hitler didn't intervene and step in, then the consequences of what might have become of the remainder of the Czech state next door may have been catastrophic. He was stuck between a rock and a hard place. If he moved in, then of course the rest of the world would be furious. It didn't matter if Hasha invited him in. It didn't matter if they treated the Czechs kindly. In the past year, he had occupied Austria and the Sudetenland, and there was an ongoing crisis over Danzig in Poland. The world, understandably, but falsely, saw this as a greater scheme to keep taking all that he could before someone put up a firm fight and said no. Churchill's claim that Hitler was set on taking over the world as well as other paid propagandists certainly didn't help Hitler's perception worldwide. There simply was no way to come out of the scenario looking good. As a result of the occupation, the powers of Western Europe would not sit by during the Danzig crisis. And as we know, the Danzig crisis led to the most costly war in history. Ironically, Danzig was perhaps highest on Hitler's priority list, and the non-German Czech lands were by far the lowest. But it was the opposite order that they ended up falling into his lap. And as a result, war would come over the most logical claim, 100% German Danzig, which wasn't even really part of Poland. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you made it to the end, please do leave a like. It helps a lot. This video was very highly requested, and I had to keep telling people that it was coming up chronologically in the Hitler series. For those of you that did keep asking, I hope this shed some light on what happened, given how confusing the whole scenario was. As always though, the biggest thanks of all goes to my Patreon, Subscribestar, and YouTube members who make these videos possible. Without the kind support on these platforms, it simply wouldn't be possible to do what I do, and I can't thank them enough. 
If you do want to support the channel, join the Discord, or our weekly Hearts of Iron 4 games, then please do consider clicking one of the links in the description. Thank you. Thank you to Lobster to you, Darway Lololol, Sigma, Emperor Titus, Luke David Murphy, Chechen Natsok, Anton Berglund, Levi E, Friendly Brian, Mr. Malabar, Bushak, Firefly Enterprise, Henry Unruh, Evan Brightfield, Chef Jeff, Ethan Wynn Stanley, Wunderwaffe, Mr. Bloom, Gav D, Guy's Longanese Hanno, JD, Green Rebel, Angus Roxborough, Rucksacker Too Heavy, Alexios Podcast Watcher, Citadel, Haste, Bojan M, Rick Me, Mr. Gaming, Cameron, Sludwig 1919, Gloomy, Troy Harsa, Jagdkampf, Rowan, Swedish Chef, Honda, Mirko, David Byers, Max Anton, Gragas, Conqueror, Espen, Khan, Luca Marincic, Veritas Unleashed, De Real G, Joel, Ghost0128, Jack, Bobby Atkinson, John DeGrief, Ward, Crankless, Dramatic Equation, Russ Hale, Senator Armstrong, Lucas Drury, It's Okay to Be a Nationalist, Inflection Point, Vet Exempt, Automat 762X39, Monsoir Mercier, Charlie Black, The Waller, Suma Klubayek, Jorgen1997, and Admiral Kempinski.